All right, welcome everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, before we jump into everything, um, it's been a month since we last met. Anyone have any exciting news? Closed a deal? Did anything exciting? Bought anything? Man, you all take a vacation in June? Um, I'll share one. We closed a commercial property. We bought it in December uh, for 77 and it was over in Aberdeen, um, out in Valparaiso on the golf course there. 4,500 square foot unit. Half of it was a, a medical facility, the other half was a salon. Um, we just turned around and relisted it. The owner had it listed at like 420, so we dropped it to 150. Uh, got, got an offer in April at 145. Commercial sales are horrible. It took about 60 days to get financed, but we closed that uh, last week, so that was a fun little victory for us. Uh, anyone else buy anything, sell anything, list anything? Man, we got to get you guys moving here. <laughs> so, um, if you want to get up and grab food, drinks, need to go to the bathroom, everything is in the back there. So, Invest in WI, our mission is to bring together <coughs> investors of all different levels, whether you're just getting started or you own a thousand units or you've done 500 flips to provide an environment for relevant real estate investment education, as well as a place to grow your personal network. In the seven uh, months that we've been doing this meeting, I've met a ton of people, made a lot of connections, met people that we've done some JV deals with, some contractors that we've used. So in addition to the education material, this is just a good place to meet, uh, meet some people and network. Um, disclaimer that the attorney makes us do, the material and content presented today is for educational purposes only. It's not legal advice. Don't take it that way. The material presented is a recollection of the speaker's personal experiences, their successes, and or failures. Consult with your own professionals prior to engaging in any activity presented here. The success of the speaker is not guaranteed that you will be successful. All right, on to some fun stuff. Um, how many of you have liked our Facebook group? It's Invest NWI. All right, and you're following it, so you see the weekly updates. Cool. Now, since you all are following it, start posting stuff. If you have questions, if you want help analyzing a deal, post it on there, and uh, you'll start getting some feedback on that. Who was here last month? Five or six of you. Did you guys get the emails um, that I sent from YouTube with links to the videos? Yeah. Okay, check your spam if you didn't see that. Um, I'm not a tech person, and for whatever reason, the videos are too long for me to attach in an email, so I have to share them through the YouTube links. Um, so check on that. I also send out an email usually about a week or two before the meeting with a video for the upcoming meeting. So if you haven't seen that, um, it's probably in your spam. I send it through MailChimp so I can kind of track who opens it. And about 50% of people are getting it. So 100% of them are getting delivered, but they're just going to your spam or something like that. So make sure you do that. Um, now as far as the membership, the point and purpose of our group, we don't want to be a sales group. But we do offer a membership. It's $90 a year for an individual, $130 for a couple. One of the things that we're doing since we're now recording these videos or these sessions is we realize that stuff may come up and you may not be able to come. If you are a member, you will have access to all of the recordings that we do. So if you're not here, you'll still get that email. If you're not a member and you miss a meeting and you want access to it, you can pay $10 for the link to the video. Same $10 that you would pay if you're going to be here. So if you have any questions about the membership or want, want to join, um, catch up with me after we're done. All right, here is a useful website. It was one of the first websites that I got introduced to a couple of years ago when I started investing. Biggerpockets.com. Who is a member on that site? All right, a good portion of you. They have a couple of different membership options. They have a free membership option and then two paid options. One of the paid options is like 90 a year, one's like 200, and it just gives you access to different things. Um, but this website is loaded with forms. Um, you can see down here, where's my laser? 
right in the middle, there's 2.9 million posts and over 450,000 current discussions. So I've posted a bunch on here, questions about analyzing a deal, help with finding contractors, how to vet people. I've read tons about rentals and flips and wholesaling. Um, the podcasts are great. They have over 200 different podcasts, um, tons of information on that. They have calculators where if you're looking to buy a flip, you can put in your purchase price, the rehab cost, sales costs, all sorts of things. They'll tell you what your expected profit is and if it's a profitable deal. Same with rentals. There's a marketplace where if you have something you want to sell, a, a multifamily or something that would appeal to investors, you can post it there. Um, there's member reviews, company reviews, so you can go on there, look up our company, Invest NWI, and you'll see reviews about us. They're bad, so don't bother with that. Um, good place to meet local investors. I think uh, Travis and I met on, on there. I've met a ton of other people through that. Um, they also have a file place, so forms, contracts, Excel spreadsheets to help you analyze deals, leases, um, joint venture contracts. All the stuff that just is a good start, obviously vet that with your own attorney, but it's a good starting place. All right, so today we're gonna do a rental roundtable, and we're gonna, we're gonna do two parts. I'm gonna start off with just the analytics of rentals. I'm gonna walk you through a couple of different ways that investors analyze a rental deal and whether or not it's a good deal. And then we're gonna have a roundtable with three investors. We're gonna come up, we're gonna answer, ask them a bunch of questions um, that I already have prepared, and then we're gonna open it up to you guys. So no hold them back, feel free to ask them any questions. And the reason that I wanted to do this, especially the first part on evaluating deals, is um, being full-time wholesalers, Jess and I get a lot of calls from landlords that are tired. You know, and we'll talk to these people and we, we look at the numbers that they, they bought it at, their mortgage, what they're getting for rent, and we're like, that's the worst investment ever. It makes no money. And they think that they're making a, making a good buck. Um, and honestly, my first rental was the same way. And the reason why was because I had no education on how to buy the, the property. No one talked to me about cash flow or return on investment or anything like that. I just thought because my rent was higher than my mortgage, I was coming out okay. So I'm gonna walk you through a bunch of things to look for when you're evaluating a deal. And then when we have the speakers come up, feel free if you have a more specific question to ask them. Now here's the thing, as I was preparing this today, there's so much information on rentals. There's so many different strategies. It's impossible for me to go into all of the detail in the hour that we have today. We literally could teach a week-long seminar on this. So if there's something that we don't touch and you want to meet one-on-one, -on -one, feel free to reach out to us after. We'll grab dinner or something like that and we can dig into some other strategies that we just don't have time for today. We are planning a Saturday course probably in October um, we're going to have a couple of rental guys. One of the guys that we're talking to about it has done over 400 rental properties in the Hammond, Maryville area. So he has a ton of experience there. We'll have property manager, attorneys, insurance people. So it's going to be an all-day seminar. We will be able to dig into that more. But today's just kind of give you an overview on, on analyzing rentals and, and to get you excited about that. So here's a question. Is this a good deal? Monthly rent is... $1,300. Your monthly debt mortgage is $990. So break that down into annual numbers. $15,600 in annual rent. Debt services $11,880. So your gross income is $3,720. If you think this is a good deal, and there's no right or wrong answer necessarily, everybody in here is going to analyze deals differently. But if you think this is a good deal, making $3,700 a year on this, raise your hand. Are you, are you factoring in all the other costs and expenses, like repairs and maintenance? You, you got the information right there. Based on the information that I'm giving you, is this a good deal? It's your first deal. Okay. That's a great answer. Gary said if it's your first deal and you want some education experience, maybe. If you believe that that house is going to appreciate and be worth much more in five years than it is now, it would make it a better deal. So if you're buying it for appreciation and not so much cash flow, who thinks this is a bad deal? Uh-oh. 
um, probably someone that wants to buy one of my houses. It's probably already sold. Um, everybody's a day late on the houses that I sell. Um, who thinks it's a bad deal and would share? Rich. So the monthly rent, that's the gross rent received? Or is that rent minus expenses? So right here, the information I have is, is I, this person collects 1300 a month. Okay. Their debt services, mortgage is 990. So their gross net is 3700 a year. A little over 300 bucks a month. Len? I am brand spanking new at this, but I think it's a good deal. Why do you say that? Because it's income and everything else should be already factored into all the costs. So you should be pocketing 3700 bucks. Awesome, I appreciate your answer. Is this a single family house? This is a single family home. If you own 10, 20, 30, or 40 of them, and the other ones pay more, this is a group. Mm -hmm. It might be something that kicked in because your management is just managing about 10, 20 of them. It's just one more problem. In, yeah, in numbers, everything's a better deal in mass. Bill? What's your end game? Is your end game to make have income now? Or is your end, end game to get it paid off in 10 years, so you retire in 10 years, and now you have 1,300 in positive income for the next 20 years. That's a great thing to think about when you're buying a rental. What's your end game? My end game on this one, this is actually one of my rentals. Um, this was my first one. My end game on this one is because it's a condo and it's upside down, I can't sell it. So, <laughs> but the funny thing is though, I talk to a lot of investors that are buying deals like this um, that think because their rent exceeds the mortgage, it's a good deal. But what if you have a vacancy? What if, you know, let's say the tenant moves out end of June, by the time you get it cleaned out, get a renter, they move in August 1st, so you don't collect rent for any of July. And let's say minor repairs, you had to fix a couple of small things. So just in that one month, you lose 18 hundred dollars now you're down to nineteen hundred dollars in net income for the year it's 160 bucks a month kind of start to see some of the things the what ifs and what if something worse happens like the HVAC my first month as this as a rental the furnace went out twenty eight hundred bucks in my first month there was all of my potential income for that year so Obviously, there's a lot of other issues that can go on, but in this situation, and I'll get back and I'll explain why this is a horrible deal, unless, as you guys had mentioned, you have a different end game in mind. You're banking on a ton of appreciation. There are some markets, Midwest markets are fairly stable, but I know people that are in Phoenix, out on the West Coast, that buy very marginal deals that have minimal cash flow because they know in three to five years it's going to appreciate 100,000 bucks then they're going to sell that. We don't really have that sort of appreciation here in the Midwest. So deal number two, I purchased it for $150,000 cash. My rehab was fairly light. I put $45,000 into it. So I'm all in at $195,000. Let's say this is a house in Munster. Rents are decent. It's a three bed, one bath. Gets $1,750 a month, $21,000 a year. After taking out insurance, um, taxes, some other expenses that come up, I net just over ten thousand a year. Is this a good deal? It's good to me. Why do you say that? Well, if, if everything's included in there, I mean, of course, a, a roof could wipe you out real quick. Right. You know, but. Um, if you get another 20 years out of the roof that's currently on there, you know, or around there. You're all in at 195? You're all in at 195, no debt. Your income is 10750? Yep. So is that 6% per year on the 195? Five and a half percent. Yep. Why don't you make it five and a half percent per year? You'd be better than that anywhere else? That's a, something that is a personal decision. You're okay with five and a half percent. Bill? It's a good deal. Be because of, you look at the market, Munster is a really stable market, and it's probably going to stay stable, so, and it'll probably appreciate quite a bit, so you got a good deal there. Anyone think it's not a good deal? I would probably find something better. In what regards? Um, more cash flow, which is 
I'm on your best. If that's if you're paying for all that cash. Just me personally, I would find deals in different markets that have higher ROI. So that's me personally. You might have more money than time and not want to mess around with where I get rental. You could buy ten houses in Gary and get thirty grand in cash flow at least. So the point of this and you hear the feedback, and this is really good feedback. Some deals, it's a slam dunk, that's a horrible deal. But a lot of stuff, everybody's different. I mean, you all have different levels of risk. Um, you can buy, spend 200000 in Gary and get a lot of rentals, have a lot more cash flow, but you're dealing with totally different tenants, totally different risk, different issues, no appreciation. You can buy a really nice single family home in Munster. Um, in a situation like this, you're only going to get 5-6% return on your investment, which if you're comparing that to what your CDs get in a bank is a pretty good return, but there are other investors that are want more and they're willing to take on more risk. So um, the big thing is, is net income when it comes to rentals. I mean, at the end of the day, people get into property investment for the appreciation gains the, and really just the passive income. It's a way to sit back, collect monthly checks without technically having to work. Although if you have rentals, you know it's a lot of work. Just by showing in, who in here at least owns one rental? It's kind of a love-hate, right? You love getting those checks, you hate getting the calls, hey, come fix this, come fix that, or making those calls, hey, where my, where's my rent? But net income is, basically it's the difference in income after you've spent all of your expenses. So you get your gross income, everything that they pay over the course of the year, minus any of your expenses. And let's kind of cover some of these. This is an example, and the example that I'm using here that I'm gonna use throughout the presentation is actually a real life example of a house that we wholesale to an individual, um, one of our investors. So, $12.50 a month in rent, that comes out to $15,000 a year in income. Let's assume on this one, the person paid cash for the house, paid cash for the rehab, so they don't currently have a loan on it, but debt services would come out of your gross income. Um, you have taxes, $2,600 a year, insurance, $1,080 a year. Um, right now, no repairs, so your net income on this property is 11320 So that's just your gross minus all your expenses. Any questions on how to calculate net <clears throat> now this is best case scenario who goes a year where you have no expenses nothing breaks nothing needs to be replaced very 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 unlikely um, also when you're buying a property you need to factor in some stuff that could come up so some of the hidden costs that and this is where when I bought my first rental I didn't know any of this stuff and this is where a lot of people go wrong. They think if their rent exceeds the mortgage, then they're coming out ahead. But what about repairs and maintenance? You know, carpet and rentals is horrible. You know, the house, my condo, I lived in it seven years. And the carpet was brand new. It looked just as good when I rented it after seven years. Six months in with the first tenant, it was trashed. And I don't know what they do, and it's that way every year. Um, but you know, I have to pay to clean the carpet every year. I'm at the point now where it's like, can I stretch this one more year or do I have to replace it? And every time it's like, I'm going to stretch it one more year. Um, paint. You know, it seems like after they've been in there a year, two years, especially if they've had kids, they move their furniture, it, it looks like junk. So you got to throw on a fresh coat of paint. Those plastic window blinds, I don't know what they do with it, but they always break. <laughs> Doors, I mean, Shoot, if they have kids, they slam through the doors, they break the hinges, the locks. Light bulbs, it seems like they steal all the light bulbs when they move out. Um, I, went as, I was in a house today that we just bought, and literally there's like two light bulbs in the entire house. But, I mean, that's normal. Um, drains, it seems like everything that shouldn't go down a drain goes down a drain. Um, broken cabinet doors, cleaning. Uh, city fees, a lot of cities, most cities, in fact, require you to reg uh, register your rental. So that could be five bucks a unit. Munster's 200 bucks a unit. So those are all go under your repairs and maintenance. Rule of thumb is about five to 10% of your gross rent is gonna go towards 
general repairs and maintenance. Then you have your capital expenses, HVAC, water heaters, windows, flooring, kitchen cabinets, bathrooms, appliances. Those are all things that over a certain number of years, just because of normal wear and tear like a roof or tenants junking them, uh, you're going to have to replace some of those bigger ticket items. So anyone in here heard of Dave Ramsey? He says you need to save money for a rainy day fund because at some point it's going to rain. With rentals, it's the same way. Before I learned all this stuff with my rental where I barely had any cash flow, I didn't save anything. So when something came up, it always was a big pain because it felt like I was spending that money out of my own pocket. But well, once I started saving that money, I save 20% out of that into a separate account. When something comes up, it's no big deal because I already have that money there. Vacancy. Chances are, if you have rentals long enough, you're going to have a vacancy. They're going to move. My condo stinks. It's two bedrooms. Everybody moves to Illinois from, or Indiana from Illinois. It's almost like a starter. They move here. They find an area they like. After a year, year and a half, they move out, go buy a house. Um, so I always have every 12 to 18 months, I have terminal. So you miss a month here, you miss a month there. 8% in that factor is one month of vacancy, which is you know, usually about well, the, my turnaround time between getting them out, cleaning it up, renting it, and getting the new person in there. Property management. Some people are out-of-state investors or they're local and they're too busy to manage your own property. So you're going to hire someone that's going to collect the rent, they're going to find the tenants, um, they're going to take care of the minor repairs. I manage all of mine right now, but when I get to a certain number, I'm going to totally outsource that, pay the 10% just to free up my time. Some property managers will do it for less, 8 8%, but they typically are going to take anywhere between 50% 75% of that first month's rent. So when you factor that over the course of a year, it comes out to 10 to 12% anyway. So right off the top out of your gross rent, you should take anywhere between 20 and 30% right off the top before you deduct your other expenses like the insurance and um, taxes. So let's go back to the one we had. We don't have debt. We still have the taxes. We still have the insurance. Let's do 10% for repairs, 8% for vacancy, 5% for capital expenses. Your capital <coughs> expenses are going to differ. If you just rehab the house, replaced everything, like your furnace, your roof, you can probably be a little bit tighter on that. But if you're buying a house and just doing enough to get it rent ready and not upgrading everything, you probably want to have a higher amount saved up for that. So once we actually deduct the, in this situation, 23%, our net income drops to 78.70. But we put $3,400 that we're saving into an account to cover all of the white what ifs. So that way when something happens, you're not charging it on a credit card, paying it out of your own savings. You already have that money there. And it just gives you a ton of peace of mind knowing that that stuff's covered. General rule of thumb, and there's lots, if you go on bigger pockets, there's all sorts of different rental rules. This is one that I actually found to be fairly accurate analyzing hundreds of rental deals. It's the 50% rule. Works really, really well for a single family home. Once you start to get up to four, five, six units or higher, this rule doesn't apply so much. But the general rule of thumb is that if you take 50% of your gross income, that's approximately what your net income will be. Now keep in mind, in any given year, you may not use up $1,500 in repairs and maintenance. You may not have a vacancy, but over a long enough period of time, you're probably going to spend the bulk of that budget that you're saving anyway. So two main ways that investors analyze deals, and keep in mind, when I say two main ways, these are generalizations. Everybody kind of does things differently, but one of the ways that investors look at deal is, is the monthly cash flow. How much money are they going to uh, collect each month? So let's go back to this first deal that we looked at. In this situation here, where they paid cash for everything, there's no mortgage, we're taking out 23% for future expenses, our net is $7,870 a year, that breaks down to $655 a month in net cash flow. Okay, now let's say this person does 
um, puts a mortgage on the house. You know, either they buy it with a mortgage or after they fix it up, they refinance out. And we'll talk about that later, but they refinance out, they get a mortgage. So in this situation, we've added $4,200 a year in debt services. That's mortgaging 75,000 at three and three quarter percent over 30 years. Their cash flow now drops to $3,600 a year, just over $300 a month. But keep in mind, in this situation, and I'll show you on another slide, they paid 50 for it, they put 25 into it, and then they refied out 75. So they're making $300 a month in cash flow with basically no money into it. So some investors, when they're analyzing a rental deal, they're gonna run through all these numbers and they're gonna buy the deal if they get a certain amount of cash flow. You know, if it's a mortgage, a finance deal, they might want a minimum of $200 a month in cash flow. If it's a deal where they've paid all cash, they might want five, six, seven hundred dollars a month in net cash flow. Again, those numbers are gonna differ based on where the property is, their exit strategy, are they gonna hold on to it for a couple of years and just sell it? Um, so a couple of different factors there, but that's one way to analyze rentals. The second most common way to analyze rentals is with an ROI. This is a return on investment. This is a measurement of the investment return relative to the cost that they put into it. So again, they purchased it for 50, they put 25 in, they're all in at $75,000, there's no debt on it. So their net income is $7,870, total all in is 75, so they're getting a 10.5% return on their investment. Now keep in mind, 23% of that gross income is being saved. If you add that back in, their actual return is closer to 15%. Now, what's a good ROI? It all depends. What's it gonna depend on? Well, one is personal preference. You know, some people might be okay with a 6% return. Some people might want 20, 25% return. So area plays a big, big factor. Um, obviously, Munster versus Gary, your returns are gonna be night and day different. In Gary, you can buy a property rehab it can be all in for $25,000, get $700 a month in rent, and have a 40% return on your investment. Munster, you might pay $150,000, $200,000, get a five, six, maybe 7% if you found a really good deal. Obviously, those are two totally different areas. Gary has no appreciation, Munster does. Gary has a totally different tenant pool than Munster, different risk factors, um, so that's something to consider. Another thing that affects your ROI is if you leave all of your money in or if you buy it with a mortgage and it's financed. A good strategy for some investors, and again, this just comes down to comfort level, is called the BRRRR strategy, B-R-R-R. -R -R. What that stands for is buy it, rehab it, rent it, and then refinance. So go back to the example I gave. Let's say you buy it for 50, <coughs> spend 25,000 to rehab it, now you're all in at 75. You put your tenant in there at 1250 a month. After a couple of months, you go to the bank. That house, in the example, is worth 115. Most banks will give you somewhere between 70 and 75 percent of your appraised value. So in that situation, you can pull out 75,000 dollar mortgage. Well, now your cash flow drops, but your ROI is going to skyrocket because you don't have a ton of money in it. So the ROI is just a comparison to how much money you have into it. So let's say, in another example, let's say you're able to cash out all but $10,000 and you're getting $3,600 a year in cash flow. Your return on that is 36%. Now obviously you have more risk because you have debt, you have to cover that if there's no tenant in there, but you're able to snowball that and you know cash out that 75, go buy a second one. And you can do that more and more. One of our um, panel members uh, has done six of those in the last 12 months. So every time he buys it, six in 12 months. And he has very little money of his own into it because he keeps pulling it back up. Some people don't like debt. They want everything to be paid for. Obviously, that's going to be a slower process. Um, 
another factor that affects your ROI is your, how involved are you in the property. I sell a lot of properties to a turnkey provider. A turnkey provider is someone that buys a property, they rehab it, they put a tenant in it, and then they sell it as a ready-to-go investment property. Now, when they sell that property, they're selling it at full market value, so you have no equity. Sometimes they sell it over market value because it's that good of a property. The example I gave, that guy has $40,000 in built-in equity. So, turnkey provider, you're probably going to get 8 to 9% cash on cash uh, return on your investment. Now, if you use a property manager, you bought it, you uh, monitored the rehab, oversaw that, but you're too busy, you don't want to deal with the tenants and all that, so you use a property manager. Gubby's going to pay a little bit more for that, have higher expenses, so your ROI is going to be a little bit less. Then if you do everything yourself, you bought it, you rehabbed it, you're all in at less, you manage it, collect the rent, your ROI is going to be higher in that situation. Um, market conditions are going to affect your ROI. Right now we're in a very, very hot market. Who in here is struggling to find good deals? Last year, two years ago, who struggled to find good deals? You know, the same house in Hammond that I could buy last year for 20 grand, I'm buying that same house, same condition for 30 grand now, just because the market's super, super hot. So I know lots of people that are buying at numbers that they typically wouldn't buy at because they have money that they want to spend, and that's the only option they have. For our flips, we're not using any standard formulas that they teach on bigger pockets because if I use those formulas, we'd hardly be buying anything. So our numbers are different, but we're doing it because we have money that's costing us money for the interest we pay our investors. So we're using it so it at least makes some money. But if you do, uh, if you, if I post these deals on bigger pockets. They'll blow me up because I'm only making 18% instead of 25 or whatever. So basically, whatever you decide to do, whether you want to go for a certain amount of cash flow, a certain ROI, figure out what your criteria is, and then go analyze properties based on that criteria, and then stick to that criteria. So any questions on that? That's a lot that I threw at you. Um, again, we could spend days going over all of this stuff. But any questions on calculating cash flow return on investment, net income? Awesome. Did I see a hand? Cool. All right, I'm going to kill this here. Let's bring our guests up. investors that um, have, have a wide range of experience. Some are just getting started, some have been around a little bit, some have been around a long time. Um, these are all investors that I've met through networking events like this one, online or whatnot. Um, but I'll start with Travis. Travis, just kind of give us a 30 second overview on when you started investing yep. and uh, what you mainly focus on. So I started investing in March of last year. Adrian's guy mentioned I bought six houses in the past 16 months essentially. And my model is strictly for just buy and rehab and refinance for a fee. Bob? I was uh, a Chevrolet dealer, uh, general manager for 40 years and, uh, and uh, was in the dealership. And, and I had to sign a non compete that I wouldn't compete within 100 miles. And my family's here, my kids are here, my grandkids are here. so. I, through, throughout the time, I really loved, the one thing I enjoyed was uh, turning and renting houses. And I just love to make a house come back to life. Um, there's a feeling in that that I, I haven't gotten with anything else that I've ever done. You sell a car, they bring back two more. It, it never changes. You don't get that that feeling that you accomplished something or that uh, instant gratification, I call it. Um, so once I was able to do that, I couldn't stay in the car business. I uh, I started rehabbing houses again, and I had done seven or eight through my life up to this point. And, uh, the past three years, I uh, I have done six, 
right now I've got three working at the same time, which is, is more than I should probably have at one time. But, uh, <laughs> but I'm trying different things. One is uh, a more expensive brick house, a uh, larger house that I'm, I'll have ready to go in three, three weeks. It's going to be a sale. Um, the other house is uh, a very simple, very straightforward house that will have very few repairs in its life that uh, will be a perfect rental. And the other one is on the lake where it's going to be a, a vacation rental, a weekly rental. So I'm trying to put them like, I don't know what I'm going to do when I grow up, so there's still a lot of things out there. For me. And I'm not the caliber of these guys, but I was pulled at the last minute to replace somebody that uh, was their caliber. But, uh, I'm having a ball. I can't, uh, I said the other day, I, I definitely have two employees that work with me. And I looked at one of them and said, I can't believe people get paid for this. And uh, it just, uh, Good time. Um, my name is Richard White. I started, uh, I was interested in rentals probably about the time I was in college because my, uh, my stepdad, my stepdad married my mom when I was in college and I would come home over the summers and I noticed that he didn't really do anything all day. And I was like, what do you do? Like, how do you do it? <laughs> he had rental property, so I thought, well, that would be really cool to get into, but I thought that uh, I wouldn't be able to do it because he was very hands-on. He was a uh, carpenter, contractor, and uh, knew everything. And I'm not very, I don't like to, you know, I'm not into labor. I just, I don't know, it just wasn't for me. But um, years later, I started, uh, my cousin invited me to a seminar where they uh, <coughs> numbers and how everything works, and uh, that was, into like sports betting and poker at the time, and I just remember thinking, man, I'm like working really hard to find these little like, you know, a few percentage points to, to get an edge, and uh, I'm like, look at the numbers on a rental property, and you know, it's like can't lose. So uh, I decided to get into rental properties. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I enjoy it. I really like, you know, getting the check. That's the part of my life. But, uh, yeah, I'm still dealing, still doing my own management, and that's not as fun. But how many are you up to now? Uh, I've got. About 13 units. Um, so, yeah. It's, uh, and I still do, and I have flips as well. So, um, but I, yeah, like, I want to build a little around side more and uh, take vacations. <laughs> so, we spent a, a decent amount of time talking about how, how you uh, analyze deals. Um, if each of you can kind of take a quick minute and when you're looking at a rental, what are you looking for in a rental? So, I'm, I'm looking for something where I can appreciate value. So, I want something where I can rehab. Really forced appreciation. What I look for is that I want to be all in for the ARV. It's the most important number for me at 70 to 75 percent of what it's going to appraise at. On the back end, what I want to see is that it's going to rent out for one percent of that appraisal value. So, for example, if the house is going to appraise at 125, I want to make sure that I can get at least 1250 in rent for that house. Then on the back end, when I look at the numbers as far as refinance goes, when I start calculating all my numbers, I'm typically seeing 200 to 300 in terms of cash flow per month. So really, my, my criteria is all in for 70 to 75% of what the house is going to be worth. On the back end, I want to see uh, hit the 1% rule, which I call it, which is, is everybody familiar with that? It basically rents for 1% of the value of what it's worth. Um, but then I also want to see two, two, typically 250 bucks a month in cash flow. And having that equity on the back end is a good thing, because if something ever comes up and you need to quick sell, you know, I talk to tons of people that they're buying these houses for rentals at full market value. If something happens and you need to dump that, <coughs> equity, you can't sell it. So that's always a good thing to make sure you have at least enough equity where you can, you know, sell it if the market goes up and down, cover sales costs, and be able to dump it quick. Yeah. Bob, what's your criteria when you're looking to buy a rental? Almost all of it is, is front-loaded to what it's going to be worth in the coming years. Um, and I know that that's not always where you get the most income. It, it isn't. I've got other people that I talk to that are making much more money buying a, a house of lesser value that may not have a good foundation and things like that. That uh, works perfect as a rental, but uh, you are not going to be able to liquidate that. You're not going to be able to sell that if something happens. And I'm, I'm up there in age a little bit more to where if something would happen to me, I want my wife to be able to liquidate this stuff immediately and be done with it. Um, there's a lot of different age groups in this. In, audience, but uh, that's something you start thinking of as you get up there in age, too. Um, the other thing I'm looking at right now is whatever you've got, if, it, if it's bought right and a good house, it's going to be worth a lot more in Northwood, in, in this area, I believe, in five years than it is now. Um, not for, for no other reason, just because, 
other than Illinois is going to implode <laughs> on its own. Um, I took my pension out of the stock market to be able to buy houses in Northwest Indiana. Um, I can't see a better value than what you're going to find right now, right here. Um, it's going to happen so fast, then you won't be able to buy them. You can look back and go, just what he was saying. I look at houses I, I passed on a year ago and kick myself. Go, what was I so fussy on? That house could have been, we could have made that house very nice, and it would have been a very good investment, and I would have had one more. Um, it's going to be a time that, that you're going to, you, you think it's hard to get now? Wait. Wait. Just to hit, just to hit on that too, for my full-time job, I do sales, but I work with industrial manufacturing companies, and I keep seeing them move from Illinois to Indiana all the time. And that's really where I got my curiosity from, is why are they coming to Indiana? And once I started looking into that, then I started realizing that the jobs are coming this way. I want to start looking where they're coming. Yeah, so that's uh, me as well. I was living in Chicago when I got started. Uh, shortly after the, the crash, the house market crashed. <coughs> few reasons. One, I saw the state, um, the state of Illinois, their budget deficit was in like the billions at the time. And I was like, they're going to have to raise taxes and they're going to be raising property taxes. And uh, so I started getting involved in Indiana at that time. That's where I was originally from, Northwest Indiana, but I was living in Chicago. So yeah, and, that, and now, um, yeah, people are just coming over so fast. When I put a house up for rent, more than half the numbers are like 708 area codes. People are really coming here. It's probably going to continue to happen. How long do you think you have? <laughs> what, what time is it now? <laughs> uh, the only way Illinois knows how to get itself out of trouble is to raise taxes. Yeah. They don't know how to cut anything. The only way they know how to fix anything is to raise taxes. Mm -hmm. That is going to that that will not that won't last. Um, businesses are taking the blunt of it. If you think house taxes are, are low, businesses are, are incredible. I had a car dealership in Lansing, and Lansing's not posh. Our taxes went to four hundred and sixty thousand dollars, and they just—they were two hundred and fifty. Let's raise them to four hundred and fifty. Why not? We can. You know, there, there's no way to keep. There's no way to keep that base. They can't keep doing that. That that state is is history, and I hate it. I, I hate to see that. I was born in Lansing. You know, my dad was a fireman for forty-one years. And it's right next to Illinois, so if anybody sees it, it was somebody who grew up two miles from Indiana. I sell properties to um, investors all over the United States. And, you know, just Indiana in general, especially this area, relative to the values of home, our taxes are crazy cheap for that. Um, obviously, taxes are an expense, so the lower the taxes, the more money that investor gets to keep. We also have very a landlord friendly laws. It's super easy and we'll talk about it. It's super easy to get evictions done. Um, you know, you can do an eviction in Cook County if it's too hot, too cold, too close to a holiday, the judge is taking a vacation, whatever the deal is, I mean those evictions could take six, nine months. You always hear people say, you know, they got the, the uh, tenants that know the system and literally can go years at a time without paying. It's just because of the laws that happen. Here in Indiana, if you know how to you know, if you know an attorney that knows how to do the eviction, you can literally have them out in about a month. So, Richard, how do you evaluate your deals when you're looking to purchase a rental? Um, I'm more about ROI right now because um, I have more time than cash, so I'm looking for a really good deal. I'd like to go by the 2% rule, which is it's similar to it's what I have into it, my purchase plus my cost, if I can rent for twice that amount. So if it costs me 50 to, uh, to buy, 25 to fix up, so I'm into it for 75. So I would need to um, rent it for, what would that be, $1,400, something like that. So, ba so basically the rent amount times 50 is your all-in price. So that's that's what I look for. And then as far as like, um, I've been having a little trouble on like the rebuilding <coughs> side just with appraisals, because they've been a little bit of a crapshoot. So sometimes I can, you know, I have the similar strategy, the Burr strategy. I, um, you know, sometimes I can get all my cash out, but sometimes but I, I just, if I stick to the 2% rule, I find, you know, you, can't, you always cash flow very well. So. And then uh, I, I do a little bit of a range. I, I do stuff in Gary. Uh, I've got stuff in, you know, Porter, Portage. Um, but I actually really like Gary. I, I think the return on investment is just really great. And uh, and I think if you screen tenants, I mean, a lot of people, I think a lot of people are afraid to go there just because, you know, they read the news and see that there's you know, shootings or whatever. But um, 
you know, I have, I have great tenants there. Um, you just screen them like anywhere else. You make a, a good property, and, and uh, people want to live there, and you'll, you'll find tenants who pay the rent uh, take care of the property. And we'll get to screening, but um, let's say you just bought a property, rehabbed it, um, and we'll just go backwards this time. Uh, what do you do to find tenants? Are there websites, tools? What have you been doing to find tenants? Uh, I just use Craigslist. Um, I was a leasing agent in Chicago, and that's literally all we used. And uh, we would post, and they would go to like seven different sites, but I never got calls off of any of those other sites. So uh, so I, I only use Craigslist. Um, and I, if I put a house up, I'm, my phone's ringing like off the hook, so I've never had to go anywhere else. Um, yeah, just take pictures and make a listing. You know, just your, everything you need to put in there, rent, you know, pets or no pets, uh, and then just trying to scrap the property, you know, just try and sell the property, and uh, a lot of pictures. I, I see uh, people post uh, houses for rent with no pictures, and that's, uh, I think that's crazy. I put as many pictures as I can. And or, or pictures of it like half rehab. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Take good pictures. And, uh, and then, you know, after I rehab the house, the first time I put up for rent, I, you know, those are the best pictures, then after, I have to turn it over later, I'm using the pictures from when I first rehabbed it, not after the tenant's been in there. So you don't, you don't have to take pictures again, and then you also get the best pictures. So I think that's a big part of it, people to call you for uh, your listing. Bob, well, how do you find your tenants? I find them through Craigslist as well, and I, I do have a lot of photos like he does, and uh, I overbuild the houses. I, I make them quite nice for people, so I, I have people fighting over them once we get them there, and, and that makes it kind of nice, because when if you have one person looking to rent it, that's always a problem. You don't want one buyer or one renter, but when there's several that want it, it starts a frenzy, and uh, you, you start to be able to, to talk to them and, and really pull out who's best on that. I'll go up and, and check out their cars and, and, and check out how they care for their cars. That's, it's there already, so you're able to see that. Um, I do something else. I don't know if it's right or not, but uh, I call them at their house when I'm a block away from their house and say, I would, uh, I'd, I'd like to take just a few minutes to, to speak with you. And they're like, okay, yeah, that'd be great, because they want that house. So they're going to say, yeah. Exactly. And I said, well, when do you want to come over? I said, I'm at the end of the block right now. Can I come over right now? And they're like, Yes. <laughs> um, My wife would freak out. Well, they all freak out. Yeah. They're running garbage out, and and, and, <laughs> it, and even when they keep it perfect, they're freaking out. Yeah. But and then you just settle down. Hey, your house is awesome. I just wanted to see how you really live, because everybody tells you they live perfect and keep it awesome. But uh, in real life, how how often does that really happen? Um, but you're able to see exactly how they really live at that point. You settle them down, they're like, shake their hand and say, your house is awesome. Don't chill. It's, it's perfect. <laughs> and, uh, and they laugh about that later on, too. They, and and they've, they've invited me there, um, so I think it's fine. <coughs> it's a better way to see them how they cared for their, their last house. And then you can ask them, what don't you like about this house? Um, a lot of times you'll find things that are, are important to them. The utilities are killing me. Really, it's a little house. How can the utilities be going on this house? It's got no insulation. This glass leaks over here. The wind blows. And I'm like, wow, I just put a new furnace in there. We just insulated everything. Oh, no kidding. And um, you find out their hot points on what they're looking for, too. As far as finding tenants, I use property management. So I use uh, two companies in the area to help them. They help me with the management side and also the leasing aspect of it. So. I rely on them. <clears throat> my my philosophy, philosophy is essentially I want to kind of build this business as far as rentals go. And I know with where I'm at as far as my day job and kind of take up the time, I want to outsource that to property management. So I use them to kind of handle all my leasing. I use two right now. I use Property Boss and I also use Caps. Does anyone use for finding tenants use any of the Facebook groups? There's like 209, Homes for Sale, Homes for Rent. I I follow that group a lot. I actually see a lot of posts on there. It seems pretty positive. There's a lot of people that tag people with different stuff. I've never used it personally, but it seems like it's 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 another social platform that a lot of people are using nowadays to see. Just your own Facebook too it helps a lot because there's a lot of people that you know, and suddenly you'll get in your own group and your own um, sphere. That, uh, 
yourself so. and people that you know or people that know you, you're going to trust them a lot more with them. Uh, just be careful on Facebook. I get suggestions of my tenants like to be to add as friends on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't do that. I never had. Yeah. Things don't always go uh, best. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about screening tenants. What do you do to do uh, to vet them out? Uh, Bob mentioned going to houses. Are there any websites that you use for background checks, or what do you guys do there? I use, uh, oh, uh, oh iscscreening.com, isc uh, screening, and then they can do, um, you can have the tenant fill, so if you meet the tenant, show the house, and they're interested, you can just get their email address, and then you go on isc screening and send a, the tenant an email, so they will, Fill out everything online and pay for it online, so you don't even have to collect an application from them, punch it in or anything. That can all be done for you on their website, and then uh, so that so they'll pay for it online. Uh, once they submit it, it takes usually less than 24 hours, and you'll get an uh, instant criminal check, uh, background uh, uh, credit check, and then eviction history. So uh, the main things I look for are eviction. Um, I just have if they have an eviction on the record, I can't rent to them, and. Uh, and it's not like the type of thing where you should be like, oh, well, they had a good story or, you know, um, because if you rent to one person with an eviction, um, you kind of have to rent to anybody who does. You can't use that criteria. You, you have to be, um, your criteria has to be the same um, because otherwise you could get nailed with like a discrimination lawsuit. So for example, uh, if somebody is um, like a protected class, which is like uh, race, gender, religion, religious affiliation, there's, um, I won't get too much into it, but there's protected classes, uh, just look up like fair housing laws. Um, so if, for example, if I rent to somebody with an eviction and I don't rent to somebody else who does have an eviction, um, that person can, and say that person who I didn't rent to also happens to be a, you know, a Muslim or something like that, they can uh, sue me and say I didn't rent to them because they're a Muslim. And I can say, well, no, it's because you have an eviction. Well, if they see that I rented to someone else who had an eviction on the record, they can say, okay, you did rent to them because they're Muslim because we know it wasn't because of an eviction. So you have to um, maintain like a standard criteria throughout. Um, so just the basic rules I have is, uh, you know, no eviction history, um, no you know felonies, and uh, also the they have to have proof of income. It has to be three times the amount of the monthly rent. So if the rent is a thousand, they have to prove that they have income up to three thousand at least. And then. Uh, I don't really take credit into account because, um, I mean, I look at it, and if there's two tenants that are pretty similar, I'm going to take the one who has the better credit, but I don't say a minimum credit score because, um, you know, people generally are renting because they have credit issues, you know, if they had great credit, they would probably be buying because it's usually cheaper than renting, so I just, um, uh, you know, I only use credit as like a tiebreaker, but I think if you just stick to like no evictions, no criminal history, um, and I always try to call the previous landlords because, some people may have poor credit because like a medical, you know, something happened or they just might not, you know, they just oh, forget to pay their credit cards or something, but some people will always pay their rent. So I just look at that, like, do you know how to pay rent? And um, if they can do that, then it's usually okay as long as they you know, have the other stuff. How do you verify it's actually the previous landlord? Uh, that's a good question. I don't really know. Because <laughs> that's the thing, right? Because they, yeah. they give you the number, so. Yeah. yeah I've, I've heard some people like ask questions about the property, you know, specific stuff they might know that they would only know. Maybe it's a different mailing address or something. Because otherwise you don't know who's on the other end. Could be yeah. a friend, right? Yeah, that's what I'm, I'm curious to see how people, how people do that. Um, so yeah, just yeah, ask about the previous, like, uh, uh, I'm sorry. How much does the website charge that person? Um, $35. Yeah. And then, uh, oh, and you should do it for every person who's 18 or older that's uh, going to be living in the house. So, um, yeah. So it can usually only help them if they, you know, if the wife has bad credit, the husband has good credit. You know, like I said, I don't you know, take the credit score, but, you know, sometimes they might need both incomes to meet that. Um, so will it still charge them 35 or will it be double? So it would be double. It would be 35 for each person. And you have to run um, the credit. You, like, anyone who's on the lease, you have to run the, the background check. So if there's so if you run, if there's two people on the lease and one of them has the eviction, um, 
then the other person has to meet all the other criteria. Yes. 20 years ago, I would hold an open house and have everybody come in and look at the rental, and, and uh, I did it a lot differently back then. Of course, they didn't have Craigslist and other ways that we've got today. But uh, at that time, you take the best one out of this whole group and felt like you were really doing something great. What an idiot. These people can buy houses. As soon as they get in there and realize that they can buy a house, they bought a house and kept moving and moving. I don't want that. I want somebody who's going to take care of my house, one. First priority is take care of my house. Second, that they're going to always pay their rent. And third, that they're going to spend all their money so they have, so they don't save a cent to be able to save a <laughs> There's so many of them out there right now. But you don't want to have the best credit. And I, I was, I kept turning people around having this house. And it was a great house, and it, uh, I had great tenants. They were wonderful. They were so good, the banks loved them. <laughs> Why would they rent? Uh, so I, I learned my lesson that way. You, you don't want, you, you got to have some criteria. What I do now, they, my, mine is a lot less stringent than theirs and things like that. I ask them to show me what their credit, there's so many things on your phone right now that will show you what their credit is. And that's not the all important thing for me, but I want to know that they're at least viable for that. And they'll do that, it cost them nothing at that point. And if you're going to have a lot of people coming through, I don't know that, I don't want to lose good people because if somebody that might be too good isn't going to spend $35 to t show me that they're that good, right? I don't want to lose that good tenant. So for me to just show me that, and then I tell them I'm going to do a criminal check and background, and they're fine, go ahead. That's done. I don't have to do it. They don't care. I don't care. Um, right? If you don't see them again. Too high risk for me. People lie too much. Yeah, I would do it. <laughs> now, Travis, you use property management. Do you give them a specific guidelines, or do you just kind of default to what their best decision is? I haven't written and opened their criteria, but <laughs> basically, I go off their, most of their criteria. They, they've been doing. I mean, a lot of them manage, you know, three hundred different houses, so they have their criteria set up as far as what they're looking for. So they'll let me know in terms of like why they selected this person, if they worked with them in the past, if they rent from them in the past. Um, so they'll, try to, they'll give me a brief history about them, but for the most part, I kind of let them. When I, when I first interviewed them, I asked them a lot of questions based off that stuff, but for the most part, I kind of I, I try to let them run with it for the most part. And then so when it comes to... Ever, uh, no, so do you ever see the tenant, like, after you let the property management, do you do, like, your own personal screening after they... I try not to, because from, from the discrimination standpoint, I don't want to get too involved. I almost, want, I almost see it, too, as, like, a, a second layer of, I guess, from a... From a property manager perspective, there's obviously risk that comes associated with that. So I kind of let the property manager take care of that. You know, if something like were to happen from a lawsuit perspective, and I'm not involved, it goes directly to the, the property manager perspective too. So, but I try to let them just essentially run with everything. Are any of you guys looking on Facebook? Check out their profiles, see what they do. Maybe yes, they have done it a few times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty good. You learn a lot about somebody sometimes very quickly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know you said you're kind of in Gary and the Portage area. What markets are you guys in? Cedar Lake, Crown Point, um, mostly Cedar Lake. Mine are all in South Hammond. Yeah, I got some South Hammond. Uh, you, uh, when you first started renting uh, renting property, did you all did you start off using uh, management or did you start off with it yourself or anything? So I guess to back up, so I, I did manage one property at one point, that was my old condo, kind of similar to Adrian, um, but that was in the city of Chicago and taxes went up, so <laughs> I got rid of that pretty quick. Uh, that's the only property I ever managed. For, since it started out here, that's, that's um, I've always used property management. And so do you keep it at, uh, so when you, you know, punch your numbers and everything, you kind of keep it at the same 10% uh, for management, or is that just something that you probably know? Yep, I put it at 10%. The one thing too is there's, there's always a leasing fee that they charge typically. Um, one company is just five hundred dollar flat fee. Um, the other company charges, I think it's the half month, half a month, uh, their first rent. So, you know, my one property is running off for twelve hundred. They charge me six hundred for it. So, that's something to keep in mind. If you're going to put ten percent, that's what they manage on a, on a monthly basis. It doesn't factor in the lease and fee. And do, you, do you find that they keep them the vacancy rates pretty low? We so we 
we've had two pretty good yeah, I mean, they try to, but that's always something you've got to be careful too, because you know, essentially you get paid off that, so. Um, yeah, because I've, I've heard it's not good to have uh, a leasing fee because it encourages turnover. Right. Yeah, it like it seems like they turn over a lot. Yeah, I mean, it's something definitely, wa wa you know, essentially we have to watch out for. Um, you know, because the cost goes into as far as background checks and credit and stuff like that, so. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's something obvious. That's standard, though, with most property management companies, you're going to get charged with recent fees. So, yeah. stuff is going to watch out for, though. Now, when it comes to leases, do you guys do annual, month to month? What's your opinions on that? Uh, I always do 12 month. And uh, I've never thought about this before, but I want to start doing uh, offering a 24 month with like a, an increase after the first year. So, uh, I just we've always just been like so we want a twelve month and usually people are just like uh, yeah sure so like, well, why not you know offer twelve or a twenty four and um, you know and, and even say oh if you do twenty four like I'll only increase twenty five dollars instead of like fifty or something like that and, um, but I found that uh, I get a lot of people who when they want to move they want to move I get a, a lot of people who ask to like end the lease early and uh, I I actually use that as an opportunity to keep the property rented because you know they're they're not supposed to break the lease so if you could say I'll let you out of the lease but I want you um, you know only if I can find somebody to you know take your place without losing any vacancy so then they're really cooperative about like keeping the place clean and you showing it a lot and uh, I've actually never had um, a full month of vacancy I mean I've, I've been doing it for a few years of, um, and I've always been able to turn over tenants pretty quickly uh, because of that because I for some reason, I just get a lot of people who want to leave early, and I just allow them to do that as long as they're cooperative with like, finding a new tenant. I, I run strictly month to month. I think it gives me more control. Um, it, it isn't that they're in their 12 months or something like that and start looking for someplace different or better after 12 months. I want them to forget about it and stay there for 18 years. <laughs> kind of gives me a lot more control. If, if you see that it isn't working out for for you, you want them out as soon as possible, and a month to month will give you more control that way. Most of mine are 12 months. I do have one in an 18-month term. Um, people moved in in January, so they didn't want to lease it essentially again in the winter. So they, they extended another six months to make sure that when that time comes up, they have it for the summer months, um, just because you're getting more applicants at that time. You know, everybody's out of school, and if you're going to focus during that time. Yeah, my first rental uh, in my condo, I did two years because I'm like, man, I'm going to lock this person in for, for two years and then after like four months I was sick of the tenant because um, they always paid late. They cooked food that just smelled up the whole building. Um, and it was just, but I couldn't do anything because it was 24 months. So, And I talked to the guy. I tried to get him to come speak tonight. He has probably about 60 rentals. Um, all, he owns them all for cash. And he puts everybody on a month to month, and his philosophy is if they like me, they'll stay. If I like them, they'll stay. If they don't like me or I don't like them, we have a flexibility with a 30 day notice just to get them out. So I've tried it both ways. I've done, um, when you mentioned the uh, people wanting to get out early, I've done buyouts in the lease where they can you know, pay two times a month rent and get out right away and still be able to get their security deposit back because that gives you time to fix it up, clean it up, and get it re rented. So again, everybody's going to have different uh, philosophies with all that. Um, let's talk about rent collections. Do you collect in a person, have them do it on a website, have them deposit in your bank? What's the best way that you guys have found to be collecting rent? I used to do, uh, I, I used to collect in person a lot, and I don't like that anymore. And now I do uh, Cozy. Um, it's free, it's like really easy. Um, so yeah, Cozy, you just uh, send them an email, it invites them. You set the rent amount, you set the lease date, and uh, it goes right in your bank. So it takes a few days, you know, from the time they initiate the deposit. It's going to take like three, four business days, something like that. But you don't have to go pick up rent. You don't have to worry about them mailing a check, get a check if you lost the mail. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to think of everyone on that now. There's there's a few people I still do pick up rent for, and uh, and then you're going to find some people who don't have email. Like maybe if you're Gary, you're right, your bank accounts. <laughs> But they can, I think Cozy can even pay with like a credit card. Um, so yeah, um, but yeah, if they don't have a email, you're kind of out of luck there, but most people do. How do you spell that? Uh, cozy, C-O-Z-Y. I don't think it's .com, I think it's like dot something. If you just put Cozy 
be right collection in the Google. Did you say it was free? Um, well, I like it because it's kind of, um, you can like set up like a lease date, so you don't keep track, it, it keeps track for you, like, you know, when the lease is coming up, you know, how much is due, and then you can set, um, like, late payments on it as well. So it's, um, it's, it's kind of like rental management software as well as uh, rent collection. No fee? No fee. Um, no. I, how do they make the money? I think they, I don't, I'm not sure. Sure. Selling information to the Russians. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I use a website, it's erentpayment.com. Same thing. Um, you set it up. It's nice because they send you emails five days before. Hey, your rent's due the day of. Your rent's due. Hey, your rent's past due. Automatically does the late fees. Um, and they charge me $3 per transaction, which, you know, relative to, you know, whoever swiped their card tonight, I'm going to pay 3 bucks for your whatever you pay tonight so and then at the end because I'm buying a house right now so you know I get to give the mortgage people a bazillion documents I can just go in there print out my year statement to show it all the rent that I've collected this year so it makes accounting a whole lot easier as well but there's a dozen websites out there that do that do you ever use any of the tenant screening tools on e-rent payment like for I have check, yeah. check? Oh, yeah. I kind of do what Bob's method is. <laughs> good car, good income, all right, you look good. <laughs> Travis, how do they collect your rent? They do it a number of ways. I know they do it online. They, can, uh, they collect it. They also have Dropbox where you can drop off your check. Um, you can come in person to the property management company. I'm pretty sure you pay them the cash as long as they're there. Um, I don't deal any with that stuff. They just direct, put a direct deposit in. I'm 15th of every month where I get my money, essentially, where they send it over. They'll send over reports and all the accounting that go with it, too. So it's pretty much to my email. This is what's getting deposited. Here are your invoices. This is what you're charged for this month. Let me know if you have any questions. So do you have, like, a portal where you can see that rents actually come in, even though it's maybe not sent to you until the 15th, but you know that, you know, six, five or six rents are in for the month on the 5th? Yeah, so the one the one company that I use, you can see that better just because they, they have an online portal, essentially, where it shows you what's coming in. The other company, I really don't find out to the 15th. Um, I know this month, one tenant I've actually had is paying late because of an injury. So they actually emailed me and reached out to me on the tenant saying, hey, um, we spoke to the tenant. By the 28th, they'll have their money. They're going to pay for this month and next month, just so, so you understand. So when they sent out the reports this month, I didn't go, hey, what's going on here? But they, they, they informed me on it. So. The injury wasn't too bright. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> the next injury. <laughs> when you have to raise your uh, rents, how do you get in the mood? Just with a letter or you call them and call them? Or how do you I think you're supposed to give them a letter. I, I try to put everything in writing, um, even like minor stuff. Um, yeah, that's But, um, you know, you it's on the lease. Um, you should try to have a paper trail for any communication between the tenant, but uh, um, usually I'll just call them and be like, you know, like rent's coming up, um, you know, it's going to be this much. And then once you once they sign the lease for it, okay, they agree to that amount, so I mean, you don't like have to get in writing, but um, you know, it's, it could just be a conversation. What's your philosophy on raising rents? Do you do it every year, or if they're going to renew for another year, do you keep them at the same? Yeah, I usually try to keep them at the same. I, I try to be a little bit below what I think the market rent is, because then I find that people will stay. Because you know, if they're looking for something else, um, you know, if they look for, if they look somewhere else, I want them to see that you know somewhere else is going to be more expensive or not as good. So I want to be you know, a little bit better than the competition, a little bit lower price. And I feel like they're going to stay. So uh, yeah, people, they've been there for years. I tend not to raise the rent, but eventually you have to, even if it's just a small amount, even if it's you know like ten bucks or you know, ten dollars a month or twenty five. It's worth doing because at the end of the year, when you do your accounting and you see like, you know, over 12 times, you know, $25, you know, a few hundred dollars, it's just worth doing just because, you know, your your repairs are going to go up, like, you know, every all your expenses are going up, so eventually you have to raise your money. Section eight. Do any of you guys do section eight? Yeah. I don't. Is that? Is that, well, try, is that by choice or by property management recommendation or? Um, need. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I would consider it, um, but I think at this point, the property management company, they, they kind of choose the tenants based off that, so it's never really been brought up or anything, um, okay. so I kind of just let them, you know, run with it essentially. Um, 
Yeah, I walk us through the process, Richard, as, as far as what's in, involved with the Section 8 tenants. Um, I one Section 8 tenant. She didn't start Section 8. Um, she was paying her own rent. She was paying on time and everything. So then she got her Section 8 voucher. Um, so it's a pretty straightforward process. Um, there's some paperwork. They, you have to, you know, they want to see the lease. Um, and she was already living there at the time, so it was a little bit different because usually, you know, you put a house up, you say you accept Section 8, and then you go and um, you can advertise it like on Craigslist or wherever you're advertising it, and you can go to the Section 8 office and you know put a listing, you know print out like pictures and print out the listing, put it in the Section 8 office. I think they put it in like a book too, so if someone is Gary and they have Section 8, they can see all the properties that are accepting Section 8. Um, so they, you know, you, you sign a lease, then you have a contract with the Gary Housing Authority, and then they come and do an ins inspection, and the inspection was pretty easy. Um, you know, they're they just want to make sure everything works, like the smoke, you know, smoke detectors, uh, hot water, you know, furnace, windows open and close. Um, you know, they're not going to nail you for like old carpeting or something like that. So they just uh, all I had to do was like put up a couple handrails on some of the stairs. There's like four stairs, and so I had four steps, and I had to put a handrail. So the um, inspections are pretty okay. I mean, it, you should be taking care of your property enough to pass the section eight inspection anyway. Um, then they they pay um, the rent is six fifty. They pay like five fifty. She pays the rest, and, uh, and now they just get a check um, or a direct deposit in my account every month. <coughs> and, um, it's like clockwork, so that's good. And then, but I still have to collect from her, um, but she pays on time. So, um, and then that really helps the tenants because uh, then they they can handle all your their utilities. You know they can. Um, and then they can handle their portion of the rent. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I really like it. Although, I would probably not try to bring like a Section 8 tenant in like a neighborhood that's not already Section 8, because I have a property in Hammond, and there's one Section 8 family on the block, and they tend to, um, I don't know, I guess not take care of the property as well. Um, so I've, I've only had one, I only had one Section 8 tenant, she was already a pretty good tenant. So, I'm, but I've heard that some people don't like to do it just because Section 8 tenants tend to, you know, treat the property like it's, um, you know, like like they're getting it for free. Do they do quarterly or semi-annual inspections as well? Uh, you know, I haven't gotten to that point yet. I, I, I think they do. I'm pretty sure they do at least they do annual. annually. They do annual. Yeah, man. Yeah. 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 Have you ever had to kick anyone out that's on Section 8, like uh, evicted or tenant? I've, I've actually had not had to do an eviction yet. I've gotten close a couple of times. The voice paid. Yeah. Can you consider, say, a tenant, Section 8 will only pay a certain amount, but then you want a little bit more than that. Would you like us to agree with the tenant on the side that, you know, yeah. They're going to willing to pay six, but they are taking this Um I've not done that. I've heard uh, that people do that. I just wouldn't. I just, I, I just want to be on the. Uh, I've heard like horror stories. And it seems like every time I've heard somebody you know, lose a lot of money or lose a lawsuit, it's because of just something stupid. So I just try to like just stay in the lines because you can make money. Yeah. <laughs> how often have you had uh, someone claim bankruptcy while they're in your house, and how long did that uh, tie it up for without getting any payments? I had to deal with that. That's, no? Yeah. I'd be interested. Have you dealt with that? Uh, no, not yet. So. Okay. I, got one <laughs> I imagine in Illinois that could be an issue, but I think in Indiana, if someone did that, as long as they're not paying, it should be fairly straightforward to get them out. Yeah. I saw that happen to uh, someone I know. It, I think it was like a two or three month, you know, that, that was a period that was about it. Was that a foreclosure house or an actual rental? It was just an actual rental, okay. traditional rental. Interesting. I wonder if uh, is that covered under like loss of rents for like insurance or anything like that? I'd be curious. Yeah. That's a good segue into our next question, rental insurance. Um, what do you, do you carry anything special on your house? And the second follow up with that, do you actually make your tenants carry anything? Um, that's something I'm going to start doing for sure. Uh, I've, I've heard some, yeah, I try to learn from other people's mistakes, and I'm, 
Uh, I definitely am going to start, especially landlords or tenants who have dogs, uh, start carrying um, $2 million in liability for prepaid through the year. So any whatever the leasing period is, that they prepay that because uh, I, I know someone who's going through a lawsuit right now um, with a tenant issue. And, uh, and then I, I have a tenant who I was out there and the neighbors were telling me she's got this big dog and they had built up their fence like they put like extra like chain link like on the top of their fence because they said their her dog had jumped over. So um, and I'm just sure that dogs are like you know you're going to most of those liability lawsuits are going to dogs and they're going to go after the you know the tenant probably isn't going to have a lot of money so they're going to go after the owner. So that's one. What do you do about the um, property damage for the section eight tenant? I was told that uh, Section 8 doesn't care whether or not um, the tenant tear up your property. It's your fiduciary responsibility to get rid of the tenant, and then they will provide you with a list of other tenants. Yeah, I, I imagine that's what would happen. It's kind of you. It's still between you and the tenant. You know? um, and I know that, uh, again, luckily I haven't had to do this myself, but I know people who, um, you know, you can sue, you can get the judgment for it, but uh, it's really hard to collect from tenants who have you know, done damages, especially tenants who probably don't have any money. This is an interesting Section 8. Do they, is there, so does Section 8 put up like a uh, security deposit, or is that for you to collect from the tenant up front still? Um, my tenant had already paid her security deposit, but I think that, uh, I don't know if they do that or not. Anybody else? Go? Yeah, they, they, they put up the security. Yeah, they put up the security. So, so they would lose that if they got the How much security is than they put up? Well, you better have taken pictures of that property and be able to back up whatever. So if you don't have pictures of stuff, it's not going to work out. Yeah, because now you're going up against the. <laughs> that might be a different program, though. That Section 8 doesn't pay. Use a little security yeah. deposit. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it was like this. Yeah. 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 These were fun. Yeah. One, that, that's a good, uh, good thing. I, um, whenever my tenants move in, I have a four-page uh, property condition checklist. I take pictures, but I go through it, and they and we go through literally every room, every window, everything. They sign off on it, and I have the pictures. When they are done, before they leave out to get the security deposit, they have to meet me there. We walk through everything again, and they sign off on it. So there's no question about, you know, by the end of it, they're like, all right, I did that, I didn't do that, that was already here. I'm like, yeah, it's already marked down, don't worry about that, so. Do you, do you have an opportunity or the right to go and check on the condition of the property if you have an 18 year renter? Like, is there? You can write it into the lease on your lease, yeah. Okay. What I, and hurt. what I do with, with mine is um, I let them know that twice a year I'm coming in to change smoke detector batteries, oh, yeah. check them, and furnace filters, and then that kind of gets me in. I do a little inspection then. So. Yeah, usually you're in there enough with repairs that the big thing with rentals, and this goes, you know, you make your money in the rental when you buy it. You don't make it on the month to month. Your money is made when you buy it. And you minimize your risk with the tenants when you do things right on the front end. You vet them the proper way. You have a strict guidelines and it's standard between everybody that you interview. You do a condition checklist. Everything is documented. You have a lease. One of the houses I'm selling for a guy, it's a horrible situation. The guy's losing probably 80 grand on this property in less than two years because he's just, it was a bad buy for him. Um, he went online, did one of those free leases. It's a horrible lease. He has no power to do anything on that property. I mean, he, it's free. So, you know, find a good attorney that does rentals, pay the 500 bucks to actually have a lease that protects you, it allows you to evict them quickly, it allows you to get in when you need to get in for repairs. I mean, I've seen leases where you need to give a week's notice to get in. That's not gonna do you any good because that gives them time in a week to patch up whatever they need, move the dog that shouldn't be there, 
I want to put some air freshener on all the poop that's in the basement. So do, do the due diligence on the front end, and all of these issues that we're talking about are going to be minimal. You're not going to eliminate everything, but you're definitely going to reduce how many issues that you have. While we're talking about insurance, the one thing that, uh, one thing that, that I found, talk to your insurance agent about an umbrella. Not just because you could be sued by people and things like that that come up, but now you're becoming owners of properties. You're going to have people up on your roof. You're going to have people inside doing repairs. You're setting yourself up for liability that could be a catastrophe for you. This could be life-changing if they sue you for more than what you've got available. An umbrella is dirt cheap. You've already got your insurance with them. When you go for a, a million, two million, whatever, a $5 million umbrella, and see how much it is, your jaw is going to drop. I just renewed mine. It's three million a year, and it's two fifty for the whole year. Two hundred fifty dollars. I was getting two hundred and fifty dollars. I was always getting sued for two million, and uh, he has a liability policy for one point. So and he thought a million was extra. Twenty. Yeah, two hundred fifty dollars. When you rent, are you buying the property? Yeah. 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 easy to have set up and they're pretty easy to maintain as well. And yeah. Um, yeah, I used to uh, Mark Fuller. Uh, he's uh, he's them, it's like five hundred dollars that includes like the plus the state filing fee. And they write up an operating agreement. Uh, just be careful you if you can put someone else on it that's even like a two percent owner because uh, I've heard that single member LLCs don't have the same protection as LLC. Um, and then what that does is it keeps your assets protected. So whatever is in the LLC, say a tenant sues you and they win, well, um, if your LLC holds up, um, then they are only entitled to what's in it. So um, do you have all yours in one LLC or do you cap it at um, five properties? Or? I, have, uh, I have two different ones. I, I try to cap it at 500000 in uh, appraised value. Um, and then, you know, as equity, Right now, there's not so much equity in it, but uh, you know, as it gets paid down, there's gonna and they appreciate, you know, that value's gonna go up. And that's really if someone sues you and wins within the LLC, that's all they're entitled to is the equity in that LLC. And uh, and also the good thing about it is they can't just come in and say they win and uh, they have like a charging order. So all they can really do, they're entitled to any distributions that your LLC pays out. But you are still in control of it, so you could just say, "Well, I'm not paying out any distributions." You could literally like never pay them. They have to keep going, keep fighting it. So a lot of people, you know, they just give up. Um, and, and a lot of attorneys, when uh, so when a tenant goes to sue you, they're going to talk to an attorney, and um, the attorney is going to look at, you know, they're going to say this happened, and the attorney's going to take it on a contingency, and their fee is you know, maybe like 30, 40 percent of whatever they're going to recover. So then the attorney's going to look at you, and they're, if they see that's an LLC in the first place, and then they they look at, okay, this LLC, and then what else does this LLC have? Like, okay, four or five houses, they have a mortgage on it that's like from a couple years ago. There's not enough equity here. You know, I'm not even going to take on this case on contingency. Now you have to pay me, you know, $50,000 to, to do this. So now it's less likely that you're going to get sued over something that, you know, that was sued to begin with. You're pretty smart. <laughs> So yeah, definitely, uh, that's awesome. definitely recommend the LLC. It depends on your financing it too. If you're going to go conventional, you can't put the LLC up front. Um, so I know that's, that's the biggest thing. You can quit claim, of course, but now you're talking about the one sale clause and stuff, which I've never really heard of it being called, but I think it depends how you're financing it. If you're paying in cash, hard money, portfolio financing, it's a lot easier to do the LLC versus, you know what I mean, conventional where it's in your first claim. He's very smart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if your LLC owns five properties, now does each property, is that owned by its individual land trust um, on top of that? I haven't bothered to do that just because I've just heard that they're, they offer no real protection. It's sort of like a layer of anonymity, but like any attorney is going to be able to you know, break through that. And I've heard that if you get on the stand and they ask you, like, you know, if you're the, um, what is it, the executive branch or the beneficiary? Yeah, yeah, then that uh, then you have to. They ask you like under oath, like you know, who is the, the beneficiary? If you're the uh, the trustee, right? The trustee is the one who controls the beneficiary. Okay, so the trustee, they know who the trustee is, 
and if you're on the sand, they ask you like who the beneficiary is, like you have to tell them, otherwise it's perjury. So, uh, so really, the land trust doesn't or they offer any real protection again. So, but that again, it kind of depends on who you ask. But I don't bother. With the LLC is probably good enough. That's why it's good to have a good attorney in your back pocket for one to get that set up before you buy anything, and two to help you if something does happen. Uh, back to the insurance, I know investors. We'll start really, really quick. One thing, uh, don't get like the, if you go online and it says like, oh, set up your LLC like really cheap, like pay the attorney to set it up because your operating agreement is like the document that you know says like, this is how the LLC is organized. Um, that has to be uh, legit, so make sure a real attorney does that. Don't do the cheap one online. Cheap when you're getting stuff set up is not a good thing. Um, and, and so same with insurance, it, it costs more to, if you tell your uh, insurance agent, you know, maybe you had a house that you lived in, you're converting that to a rental, call your insurance agent and let them know it's a rental. It's going to cost more because there's more risk and liability for them. So there's going to be some extra benefits in there that they're going to um, add. They'll probably increase your liability, they'll probably increase the personal injury on the property. Um, they're going to probably add, you'll have other things like lost rents that you can add in there. So if there's a fire or something catastrophic happens, you can actually collect rent while no one's there and it's being rehabbed. Um, so don't skip out on that. And then um, increase your deductibles to you know a couple grand to minimize the cost. And then turn around, make your tenants um, get renter's insurance. And then part of that renter's insurance you know, will pay you some money, which will cover your deductible. Give them like a hundred dollar Visa card if they get it within the first thirty days, so it just, it just protects you more in that situation. Uh, on insurance, we we actually just bought a house in Four Seasons. Crazy enough, the tenant apparently disappeared last July. You know, it's dead, jail, whatever. Somebody paid rent until this year, and uh, I, don't, I don't know who, but somebody did. So. The, the lady, oh, yeah, I yeah, I don't know, I, I can't even get tenants who are living there. Um, <laughs> so, so like, whatever happened with the guy, like brand new 2010 vehicle in the driveway, so Four Seasons called her and said, look, your, you know, your grass is a foot tall. Somebody cut the grass all the time, too. And uh, so she came back from Florida and the house was vacant. It had a broken water pipe. And she called Nipsco and the gas had been off since last year. And she went to she went to make a claim, and, and they won't cover it because the house is vacant. The insurance company uh, knew it was vacant. So know your vacancy policy because, like for our insurance policy, if the property isn't occupied in 60 days or less, they're not going to cover it unless it's boarded up. We use REI Guard. I know a lot of investors here do. Um, you know, if you got a vacancy on a property, it's vacant three months, and we burns it down. You may have no coverage, and those insurance companies are not going to pay it. I can assure you, they denied her claim, and she probably lost. Seven thousand dollars in the house because of damage. And so know your insurance policy. Don't don't hire the State Farm guy in the corner that does your life insurance. You know, get, get, go to an insurance guy that knows rental properties, that knows investments properties. You guys use REI Guard? We do for everything. We're in and out of a lot of stuff, so you know, I mean, it's hard to find an insurance company that'll insure a property for five days or something, or one day, or. Two weeks, but so we use them across the board. But I do wonder if REI Guard, if I had to make a claim, how the service would be. I mean, but it's it's underwritten by Lloyd's of London, so on the other hand, they're new policies. So. Yeah, you always find out like when you have to make a claim, like why you're saving all that money on your insurance. The hinge dance people. Yeah. <laughs> all right, I'm done with my questions. Let's open up any. Feel free to ask any questions to any of them. You can generalize it to everybody or pinpoint one of them. Your uh, property management company, do they charge you a to evict your tenant for not paying? Yeah. Is there an extra fee? Because like there was a fee for just getting the lease tender. Right. So is there a fee to kick that tenant out? Yes, yeah, so I still have to pay for it. It's like $500. And then they use, uh, I think it's Jonathan Peterson out of Monster. I think that's who they use. Um, they keep them out 14 days, but that still falls on. <laughs> do you just pay the, the attorney fee, or do you have to pay like something for that? Or? Just the five hundred dollars for the attorney fee. Yeah. How, how do you refinance your properties uh, so fast? So we the, gotta season ours for six months. Right, and that's the biggest thing right now is the seizing part. Um, one thing that I do is I borrow hard money, and I know everybody's like, "Well, that's crazy." Well, I can actually get a loan at seventy percent of the appraised value of what it's at. So if a 
So if it's a hundred thousand dollar property and I get a loan from hard money at seventy thousand, I could essentially rate and term refinance that as soon as I have it rehabbed and rented out. So if I'm doing if I get a rehab and rent it out in three months, I can have that refinance process start because they're just rate and term that seventy thousand. I'm not cashing out like you have to wait the season period for the six months. Are you doing conventional or you those are portfolio? I'm mostly doing conventional right now. My my goal is right now is to get those conventional spots right off the bat, and then I'll focus on the portfolio side. What do you need? Uh, as far as uh, for hard money or for conventional side. Wait, you, um, sorry, I missed that. Like, so no. The rate of refinance, you're using different a different lender for the hard money than the refinance. Yeah, exactly. So I'll use a hard money lender, and then I just have my regular lender that does conventional loans, and I'll, I'll switch over to him. But a lot of, if I want to cash out refi, I'm going to wait for six months too. Does your property manager start giving you a break the more rentals you have? Uh, definitely negotiable, yeah. You kind of answered it. Um, I'm interested in a bigger project. It's got a really called like house hacking. Mm -hmm. um, I'm buying multi family uh, units, uh, living on one side, right not the other. Uh, I'm just trying to see something for anyone. If you know anyone who does that uh, that method, or and, and how would that experience go? Um, it's good because I don't have a mortgage, but uh, now you're like living next door to your tenant, so you really have to be careful who you rent to. When I bought it, there was a tenant there, and I kind of inherited her, and it ended up getting like really bad. Like she. Uh, she had gone off some medication and like lost her job. <laughs> and uh, she started like accusing me of going into her like like her apartment when she wasn't there. And uh, and she started like uh, she texted me and saying that she was like having suicidal thoughts and just it got really bad. Uh, so I had to put up cameras and then uh, eventually she just like bolted. She was still paying the rent and. Uh, she just like just left in the middle of the night. Just like one day, just she was just gone, and then the next day her nibsco got shut off. So I was like, oh, that's why she did that. But um, yeah, she was like saying things about like I was a little worried there for a second. I thought she was gonna try and sue me, and she was like threatening that uh, like she's like, oh, some light bulb was out like on the porch, and she's like, oh, you better change that because if I have to change it myself, I don't want to like slip and fall and have to sue you or something like that. And uh, so it was a little scary there. But um, yeah. So just uh, if you do that, uh, I mean, I, I really like it now because now I have good tenants. Just um, just be really selective about who lives there because they're going to be like your neighbor and they're going to be asking you a lot to fix stuff because they know, you know, when you're home. It, it, might, it might actually be a good situation to use property management just to kind of yeah. really yeah. 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 Now, in a situation like that, fair housing doesn't apply, so you can literally pick who you want to live next to. Except it still applies for a race. I, believe. So. I wish it would become cost efficient to start using the property management. How many properties that you can acquire? Uh, for me, I'm going to probably start doing it soon, but I might uh, try and start my own property management company just because I really want to you know, be able to keep an eye on things. And uh, I've been doing it long enough that I think I can you know, probably train someone to do it okay. So I might just. You know, I'll still have someone else doing it, but I'll, um, you know, be in, in charge of them just kind of. How many properties did you start and then decide to do Um, I want to see how many, like, I can do before it's just too much, and I actually, like, have to hand it over, and that hasn't quite happened yet, but I feel like it's happened, it's going to happen soon, because I'm now doing so much other stuff, like, uh, you know, getting more stuff that I have, like, less and less time, but um, I'm trying to put in, like, systems in place to save on time management, you know, like, one of those things is, uh, like I said, like collecting the rents uh, online, you know, that saves a lot of time. Um, I'm looking maybe even like having like a call center, like taken and coming like request for repairs, and then just have them like forward that to an email, and then I could have like my handyman like just um, check that email every now and then. So I'm just trying to find ways to save time doing that. But uh, I don't know what the number is. Where like I've heard that uh, something like 27 or 30 properties per like person. So if you so like one person can reasonably like do that amount I've heard people say that. How many properties do you have total did you say? Uh thirteen. You said that um do you like the uh, month to month uh um, lease agreement? Oh no I don't actually <laughs> um 
do you get them in a fancy baby or a certain length of time when they want to move out? Or 60 days, you know, 30 days, 30 days, 30 days, 30 days, 30 days, 30 days. I found that they were pretty, pretty good too, I like that. It, you know, on paper it probably doesn't sound the best, but no. when you really get into it, yeah. if, if, if you don't like each other, if it isn't working out, it isn't going to be better next month. No, no. It's not going to be better the month after that. It's just going to keep getting worse. And you're going to have, there, there's somebody out there that wants your property, that wants to live there, and wants to make it a nice home. The other thing that I try to do that so uh, I kind of dangle them, because I do end up selling my properties at some point or another. And dangle that out there, that sometime you might be selling this, and if they're looking someday to get a house, um, I want them to take care of that like it's going to be their house. How come they keep everybody on their toes? It keeps everybody on their toes. It, yeah. it does. Um, they're trying to put, make their best behavior as well as you're trying to keep them there. I, you know. I'm it, curious, on your month to month, how many times did you ask somebody to leave after a couple months? That it didn't go 12 months? Once. And how many years have you been doing it? I don't have a lot. I don't have huge numbers like these guys do. But, so. <laughs> I I don't set that up ahead of time. I have a friend who's done very well with that out of Tennessee. And um, I, I said, listen to him talk about it. It's genius the way he sets it up. But um, I don't set any parameters up, up front with that at all. I just uh, ask if they're talking about their plans or their dreams someday. Yeah, we'd like to, to buy a house someday. And as well, there's been, so there's, there's three times so far that I've had people renting my houses that ended up buying them at a later date. We don't have anything set in stone. They may buy, be wanting to buy when I'm not wanting to sell. I may be wanting to sell when they're not wanting to buy. But uh, I have nothing set up like that in stone, but just that carrot out there to, to take care of it as if it, it might be their own, or to treat it like it's their own house, not a rental. And it's amazing how good they take care of them. Then. I, I, I'm, I, I'm blown away at, as to how good renters can take care of their homes if it's handled right. That's a great strategy. The biggest complaint that I hear from people that are, are doing that is the landlords aren't really vetting the person and their ability to buy the house eventually. Um, they look at it as a way to get more money because they're putting down a higher option for the rent part. Um, and then if they don't exercise the option to buy, they're keeping, instead of having a $1,000 security deposit, they might have a $3,000 option fee. Well, in two years, if they don't buy it, maybe because they never had the ability to from a credit perspective anyway, they lose that $3,000 in their either renew it for another three or to go find another place. So if you actually care about the person and their ability to buy it and find someone that within a reasonable amount of time could buy it, it is a great exit strategy. Not to, not to mention if it's a great family taking care of it, but they can't get that bank financing yet, I mean, you're still making that monthly. It's, it's knocking down your monthly, uh, well, it's going towards a monthly payment, knocking down some of that principal little by little. And it's, and that's exactly who you want. That person yeah. isn't saving up the money for the down payment, but still keeping it like it's their own. And yeah. it's, it's great for both They're parties. They're responsible for repairs. Yeah. Plus, you get an option. I mean, you usually up front, yeah. which is nice. Yeah. I've rented, and you know, the yard work, yeah, you kind of do enough to keep it looking okay, but I'm not spending tons of money putting in fertilizer <coughs> and plants and all that, knowing that it's not my property. So if they have a vested interest, knowing that at some point they could own it, they're definitely going to take care of it a lot better. Sometimes they'll they'll leave behind. You know, I got one guy he left behind like new windows. Uh, well, the roof was because of insurance uh, tornado. Big old Franklin fell into the the roof, but uh, he put up new siding. He's going to put up a new deck, and then the wife wanted to move. Uh, another one he wants to put up a, a new deck. I forget the size, but he was saying like. 14 by like 26 or you know a new deck and so like, hey that, that's what you want that you know it's your house you know so they, they walked away from the deposit uh yeah yeah the first guy the first guy they're gone so they put a five thousand and 
you know, it, it was specified, everything was specified up front in the paperwork, made sure they were coherent and not drunk or high. <laughs> yeah. So, so <laughs> like, the guys have put it, that wanted to put the deck on, do you like put a, in the agreement, like, okay, if you want to add on or do any kind of repairs or whatever to the house, is it put into the, your lease? I uh, really the only thing is is like let me let me know if it's a job that is uh, that requires a permit if it's of that size let me know but uh, you know basically I'll, I'll probably have to pull paperwork and stuff like that anyway but um, yeah that's that's really it you know it's you know really go through it up front you know it's, it's their responsibility to not only take care of it but if they want to do improvements they're more than more than welcome to you know. You know, there's some people out there, you put a paintbrush in their hand, and then all of a sudden it's like someone got in a fight with a five-gallon bucket and <laughs> shaking it everywhere. Uh, do you guys look at any like larger multi-units, or do you work with anybody that looks at larger multi-units? Or have you thought about Not it? Not there yet. I'm, um, I'm part of a like, mentor group with um, commercial units, like commercial buildings. Uh, like five units and above, and it's a lot different. Uh, you know, if you don't have any of your own money or a little, I mean, it, it takes a lot to buy like a, a larger building. So you're looking more like syndicating. Uh, you're bringing in like multiple investors, and then you start getting into uh, disclosures and uh, it's called a private placement memorandum, which is like fifteen thousand uh, just up front, just to start raising money. Um, yeah, it's a lot different. You uh, <coughs> period is a lot longer. You put up, um, you, know, you put in like a non-binding offer, and then uh, and then once you get an accepted offer, then you have you know a lot more uh, due diligence. You're like kind of going through their financials, making sure you know everything is like how they say it is. Uh, yeah, financing is a lot different. It's it's a lot different, but I've looked into it a little bit. I'm, I'm uh, working with a partner right now. Uh, he's like a restaurant owner in Chicago, and um, I'm starting to get a little bit more into the partnership side of it, like working with people who have more cash than money and just giving up a little bit more of the deal to, to get more deals done. And that's kind of like the commercial side of it is a lot of that. It's a lot of, um, you know, like we're on the single family homes, if you're doing all the work and someone else is bringing in the money, you know, you might just give that person, you know, a small percentage of what you're doing. But with the commercial deal, you know, you're doing a lot more of the work and basically the investors, just the people putting up the money, like this almost automatically get just half of the deal just for um, taking on that. But it, yeah, it's a lot different. Our September speaker is an investor who, um, not, not an old guy, but he's been doing it for about 20 years, and he has over a thousand doors right now, um, anywhere from single families up to very large complexes. So he'll be here in September talking about multifamilies. Because like Richard said, it's a completely different ballgame. Uh, he's been working on a deal with a bank right now for a 500 unit building um, here in Northwest Indiana that's many, many millions of dollars. And he's probably 120, 150 days into the deal right now, still doing due diligence and reviewing everything. I guess I'm tied into my next question. I was like, kind of how, where you guys are sourcing most of your deals, but uh, that kind of deal, like five, six, you know, even like 20 units, which could be found for like a reasonable cost, but the supply of it is just, I mean, certainly on the market is, is I mean, next to nothing. Um, so. Yeah, um, there's, you know, it's a smaller pool of competition, I guess, because there's you know, only so many people who can do that. Um, but yeah, I think you're looking at like 20% down, you know, there's no like FHA and there's, and there's no like, uh, um, like forced appreciation, like the you know, like the strategy he's, you know, we're doing is uh, you know, buy it, fix it up, refi, get all your money out, and do another one with an apartment. You're not probably not gonna be able to do that. You're just gonna have to put in, you know, you're gonna have to find uh, twenty percent of the value. So if the the apartment's building's worth five million, you know, you're coming in with um, what, what is that like one million bucks? Yeah, you're coming in with a million dollars of cash that is gonna sit in that property. So the people bringing in that money, the investors, they're gonna get fifty percent of that deal. And, uh, and they're you know, looking at like a cash and cash return. They get like, like, like the preferred return. In most cases, they're gonna get like the first 4% or 8% out of the deal. Uh, so yes, yeah, so it's a lot different. 
You mentioned that mastermind group, I think. Uh, it's seconds. called um, Apartment Mentors, I think. Uh, it's, if you Google uh, Anthony Chara, uh, C-H-A-R-A, -A, it's his group. And uh, it's really good. I would recommend it if you, um, you want to get into it. Um, yeah, they go over a lot. And then, uh, and then they offer, like, um, you know, proof of funds and things like that if you want to start, like, putting an offer. Are those local or is that, like, mostly syndicated across the country? Um, yeah, it's pretty much the... The commercial market is pretty much national because, you know, like how many commercial buildings are there in Northwest Indiana? I mean, right. you know, there's a few, but, you know, to find a really good deal, you're going to have to see a lot of places. So it's kind of like a national market. You had um, an apartment that had hardwood floors, but they had carpeting over it, and we know that the carpeting is, is bad. Would you opt to sand it and make it nice and instead or replace just I definitely do the hardwood floors because, like he was saying, the carpet just always, uh, you know, you could, they're gonna, they're gonna mess it up. The floors always, like, they always go hard on the floors. So you gotta scar up the floor. Yeah, but, but well, hardwood floors I think hold up a lot better than, uh, than anything else. Carpet. Yeah. Anybody, anybody try the sandless uh, instead of sanding? If they do it with the wet sanding on it, then uh, it's quite a bit less money and it doesn't make all the mess and everything like that. Yeah. It's, it's right, but looking at sanding, it seems like it's about three dollars a foot by the time you get it all three coats of urethane. This is uh, about a dollar a foot. Um, it's not quite as good, but it looks like it's uh, it's eighty five percent as good. <laughs> There's times eighty five percent is good. <laughs> is that like using a, a buffer? It's called um, eighty five percent for sandless. <laughs> sandless. <laughs> Any other quick questions for these gentlemen? How does your property management company handle repairs? Sure. So anything under 250, they just go ahead and take care of. Anything above that, they call, they contact me. We just had it happen. Actually, there was a tree out back. Went through one of the sewer lines. I had to run some of the sewers. So that cost about $1,200. <laughs> so that wasn't fun. But they, they'll contact me about that. Do you find the repairs <coughs> are, the repair costs are reasonable? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Let's thank these guys who definitely have So rentals can definitely be a lot of fun. I mean, you heard some good information there. Um, the big thing is just do everything right on the front end. Make sure you're buying something that's going to be profitable. Make sure you're taking the time to um, you know, get an LLC set up correctly with an attorney, have an attorney prepare your lease, um, get the proper insurance. That way when something does happen, you're adequately protected. And then the big thing, you know, you hear all these gurus talk about no money investing and all that. Rental is probably not something you want to do without money. Um, I mean, keep in mind you got someone depending on you to provide a safe environment, and if something happens and you don't have the money to repair it, you're not really doing a good service to them. So make sure you have a little kitty set aside to um, take care of something if something does come up. So it can be a ton of a ton of fun, um, and yeah, you hear the horror stories from people, but really, if you do everything good on the front end, you're going to minimize all of that, and you know. Literally just sit back, collect checks, and make sure that you're taking care of the people that are there. So I know we threw a lot at you today. Um, some of you that are just getting started or only have a couple might have been overwhelmed by the information. If you guys want to discuss a deal that you're looking at, you want to sit down and really dig into some of this, don't hesitate to call us or reach out to some of the people that were here and, and uh, take us out to coffee, and, and we'll definitely share some more stuff that we have one-on-one. -on -one. So. Um, any deals, this is an opportunity if you have a deal that you're marketing or you're looking for help on something, you need funding, um, stand up, introduce yourself and let us know what you have to offer. Boom, boom, boom. Awesome. I don't really have a deal to offer, but I'm more looking for those bigger commercials, not bigger commercial size deals, I say like medium sized commercial deals, so Richard, can you grab your thing? <clears throat> 5, 10, 15, 20 units stuff? Something like that, yeah, around 20 units. 
I'm giving Richard money. He's giving him fifty percent. I um, uh, we do a ton of wholesaling. We need to actually start marketing that. Um, I listed a duplex. This guy bought it for one seventy-five two years ago. Inherited a tenant. Stuff happened. He, I mean, he he's not, he wasn't meant to be a landlord. He didn't do his due diligence on the front end. Um, I listed it at ninety-nine. It went above that. I mean, it had so much activity. Most of the people were like Audrey. They actually were buying it to house hack where they wanted to live in one side and then rent out the other side. Basically, the rent was paying their mortgage, so they're living for free. But um, I didn't ex I didn't realize how uh, excited people were going to get over a duplex. But it, it had a ton of activity on day one. So where was that? It was in Highland. I mean, I listed at ninety nine for a duplex. I mean. Yeah, it's a good smoking hot deal, right? Surprised you didn't buy it. Absolutely, I, I, I can't. I wish I could. Yeah. <laughs> I salivate every time I see you. Do you? Yeah. I got a bunch coming out for you too. I'm gonna do a lot of salivating. There you go. <laughs> All right. So next month, Monday the 21st, we're gonna have an appraiser come in here. The appraiser that I'm working on getting in here is also an investor. Um, whether you are flipping houses or doing what a lot of the guys up here mentioned, refinancing out after you've already rehabbed your rental and it's occupied, one of the biggest scary moments is the appraiser. Is the appraisal going to come back at your purchase price at an amount that you need to uh, get so you can get most of your money up? So this appraiser, he's an investor. He understands our mindset. He understands our desires. He's going to walk us through the appraisal process, how they make their decisions and give us a few tips on how we can increase the appraisal. Um, September, since it was brought up again, we're gonna have, our September guest is someone who owns over a thousand units, multifamily, he's gonna talk mainly about buying multifamily properties and everything that goes into that. Again, membership, um, you can pay as you come, $10 a month. Um, if you miss it and you like the topic, you can buy the recorded video for $10. If you are a member, it's $90 individual, $135 for couples, partners. Um, that will give you access to any um, handouts that we have for that meeting or any of the recordings if you weren't available. Again, we, it's always the third Monday of the month here at our office. At some point, hopefully we're going to outgrow this space. So um, feel free to help yourself to any more food. We'll stay here uh, as long as people are here, network, talk. And uh, just have fun. Thank you. Thank you. I gotta give them away, but thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Yeah, I should be. Yeah, it's